Zapraszamy serdecznie na konferencję lafizrael.org, która odbędzie się od 15 do 17 listopada we Wrocławiu. Potrzebujemy Twojego wsparcia na pokrycie części kosztów organizacji konferencji. Całkowita kwota do zebrania to 5000 zł. Wpłat można dokonywać na konto Kościoła Dom we Wrocławiu z dopiskiem Konferencja Baruch Korman. Za wszelkie wsparcie dziękujemy. Więcej szczegółów oraz plan konferencji przedstawimy wkrótce. Throughout the scripture, we see an emphasis upon the word of God. Now, we know that there is the written word of God, but there is also what the scripture speaks of as the Rima word of God, and that is a proclamation. Now, you and I today, because we belong to Messiah, we have received the gospel, we can become those who are recipients of those Rima words. What is that? Well, there is the written word, Scripture, and it outlines the purposes and the plans of God. But the Rima word, well, it is proclamations that bring about those plans and purposes in a person's life. And we've been studying how Messiah has been, been speaking to the disciples, how he has been training them that they might mature where they can be recipients of those Rima words. And not just receive them, but to proclaim them boldly before others. See, we as the disciples of Messiah, we have an opportunity to speak to the world in His behalf, to proclaim the fulfillment of what He's going to do. And when people are, are touched by that, and if they are seeking God, If God is working in their life, they're going to recognize these words as being anointed by Him. They're going to recognize them as not words of man, but words of God. And what is the foundation for understanding this and being able to recognize this? Well, right where we left off last week in John's Gospel and chapter 17. Look with me to verse 8. Now, Messiah has been talking about how the people, meaning the disciples, They have come to know that, that Yeshua is from God and that Messiah is preparing them for his departure. And notice what he says in verse 8, John chapter 17 and verse 8. He says, because the words, and it's in the plural, and it's this Rima word, this proclamation that, that God the Father makes. He says, because the words which you have given to me, that is God the Father, He says, I give to them. Now, in this passage, Messiah is, is praying for disciples. And he's praying not just for the disciples, those, those 12 there, but he's praying for the disciples throughout ages and especially those in the last day. Because Messiah is always thinking about the kingdom. So he's thinking also and praying for that generation that will see the kingdom of God established. Verse 8, because the words which you have given to me, speaking to his father, I have given to them. And he says, these they have received and they have known truly that from you I have come. And they believe that you have sent me. Now, how many times has he said in chapter 16 to 17 that he has been sent by his father but people you know they they may hear that they may say that but here's the question when persecution comes when hard times are at hand when people are suffering for their faith are they going to really believe that this one who they're serving this one that they're testifying about that truly he is God's anointed that God sent him into this world and everything that he said he received from the one true God. It's only a faith that truly believes that and knows those promises because the promise of the Holy Spirit is this, that He is going to supply everything that we need, not everything that we want, but everything that we need to be faithful to God's purposes and plans in our life. And if we believe that, then when dark times come and they're coming, there's going to be strong delusion in this world. It's only we who believe those things with all of our heart 
that we're going to recognize the times that we're living in. We're going to recognize the enemy. And we're going to be people who speak truth knowing that there's people out there that are being called by God. There's people out there that want to come into the kingdom. Times of persecution brings about great numbers of decisions for Messiah. So, verse 8, he says, And they have received, and they know truly that from you I have come, and they have believed that you have sent me. Now, notice when that is a reality of a person's life, there is a change that comes upon. Why? Look at verse 9. He says, I concerning them pray. Not concerning the world do I pray. So this is very similar to what we see among the prophets. The prophets, they pray as well. Their ministry, their words was not to, to the world, but rather it was to those who had a covenant relationship with God. So at this time, Messiah is praying for the disciples. What disciples? <laughs> All disciples, but especially those at the end of the age, that they might live out that testimony, that they might display that confession that they believe that Yeshua is from the Father. So he says, I concerning them pray, not concerning to the world do I pray, but concerning those who you have given to me, that to me, or to from that you, to you they were. And now, look at verse 10, he says, And all that I have, he says, is yours. And all that are yours are mine. Now, what's he saying here? He begins speaking about, and this is not the first time, speaking about this unity between who? Between his heavenly Father and himself. And he says, all that is to me is yours, and all that I have is yours. Why is he saying that? to show a common purpose. He's trying to tell us, unless we realize that, that all that we have is from Him, and all that we have is to be given back to Him, that we are simply tools of His for a greater purpose. And what's going to be the outcome when we realize that? <laughs> an unbelievable joy, a satisfaction that the world can't impact, can't change, can't alter, it's going to endure. So Messiah is demonstrating this when? He says that shortly before his suffering, shortly before he demonstrates his love and his obedience to the Father by laying down his life. This is a message, it's an example to believers in the last days for, for those who are going to be persecuted for their faith. He says in verse, verse 10, and I have glorified, I have been glorified in them. What does that mean? By them following him and not acknowledging who he is. And no longer am I in this world and they are, are in the world. But I go to you, O Father, or Holy Father, and they, you are to keep in my in your name so he says here and it's a very important passage let me read it again he says and no longer am i in this world also they are in the world and i go to you but he says father holy father keep them in your name those whom you have given to me in order that they shall be one now in this scripture we see Messiah saying, I'm departing, and I want you to keep them in your name. And notice how he speaks about, about uh, God here, Holy Father. Why is that important? Because this term holy is always related to the purposes of God. So how do we find ourselves being kept in the name? Remember name? Character. How do we find ourselves being kept in the character of God in the midst of all of this? Well, it's all wrapped up in the word holy. Why is that? Holy is related to the purposes of God. We are going to be kept in the character of God 
when we are pursuing the purposes of God. That's what Messiah is trying to tell us. So, no longer am I in this world, and they are in this world. But I to you go, Father, Holy Father, you keep them in your word, those whom you have given to me, in order that they are one just as we. Verse 12. When I am with them in this world, I have kept them in your name. Those you have given to me, he says, I have kept. And none of them have I lost except the one who is the son of perdition in order that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So why is he saying this? Well, there is one, and we know that's Judas Iscariot. And this one was an individual who was was led by his own evil desires. The scripture says that Judas, from from the whole time that he was ministering, so-called ministering with the disciples, what was he doing? He was taking money from the treasure. He was the keeper of that. And that was wrong. You don't think the, the Holy Spirit would have convicted him? You don't think that he knew it was wrong? Of course he knew. The law says that stealing's wrong. And he just continued to do it over and over and over. And what happens? Well, when we rebel against the Word of God, when we don't listen to what God is placing upon our heart, what happens? Well, we know that our conscience becomes seared. And that's exactly what happened with Judas. So much so, when he heard of the plan to try to arrest Messiah, to to gather him up at a fitting time when the people weren't around because Yeshua was still at the very end, he was very popular with the people. We'll see that in a few, few weeks. Well, Judas, because of his love for money, because of his covetousness, what happens? Satan enters into him. And therefore, because of this connection with the enemy, his desires, not God's desires, what happens? Well, he's called the son of destruction. Now, this is being said, why? as an example for us. What did Messiah do with all those other disciples? He kept them. None of them was lost at that time frame. It was only after giving of the Holy Spirit, and notice the difference. At that time frame, what happened? Well, we're going to see. The shepherd was struck and the sheep scattered. They didn't have a mature faith at that time when Messiah was arrested. It was only after the resurrection and after the giving of the Holy Spirit that what took place? That these individuals grew. And they didn't run away from persecution. They stood. Remember when in the book of Acts, the disciples, some of them were thrown into prison and the angel set them free? Where were they? They went right back in the place where they could have been arrested again, and they were before the Sanhedrin. They didn't care. Why? Because what was important to them was speaking the truth of God. So look here in verse verse 12. He says, When I am with them in this world, I have kept them in your name, that is, in your character. Those you have given to me, I have kept, and not one from them has been lost except the son of perdition, ordered that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 13. But now to you I go, and these things I have spoken to the world, or why I was in the world, in order that they shall have joy, my joy, that it should be fulfilled in them. So listen to what he's saying. He's talking about his departure, and what is he concerned with? that they might have joy. But here again, we have to remember, how does one receive that joy? Well, he's already said, to be kept in your name, to be kept in your character. And where do we encounter the character of God? Well, the best way to understand God, His character, His attributes, His personality, is through His commandments. What He tells us not to do, and what He tells us to do. And Judas was a violator of that. But those who submit to that truth, well, they're going to be transformed. So now 
I am coming to you, Messiah speaking in this prayer, I am coming to you, and this I say while I'm in the world, in order that they have joy, my joy, should be fulfilled in them. Verse 14, I have given to them your word, and the world hates them that they are not from this world just as I am not from this world so Messiah he was not of this world in his nature and he dis displayed that in his teachings and in his actions likewise what we're seeing is that those disciples are going to be that same way they are going to grow and mature speaking about here again context near the kingdom of God near the establishment of the promises of God these disciples and we see the early ones give a foretaste of that as they suffered greatly and some were put to death to their faith but that is going to become a normal reality in the last days for believers so we read in verse 14 I have given to them your word and the word world hates them See, when we are obedient to the Word of God, the world hates us because they are not from this world just as I am not from this world. Verse 15, I, he says here, I have not prayed in order that you should take them out of this world, but in order that you should keep them from the evil, from evil or from the evil one. Now, this is going to become a very important truth in the end. What he's saying here, and this is another indication that we're talking about the last times, because he says, I am not taking them out of this world. Well, he's not until when? Until the very end, at the time of our blessed hope, the rapture. Up in that time, we're called to bear testimony. And isn't it significant that he's talking about suffering and persecution and being hated? I mean, this hate that he's talking about is going to manifest itself in the suffering of the disciples. And he says, my prayer is that you don't remove them because they have to give testimony. And that's why we're the recipients of the Holy Spirit. He's going to testify through us. Verse Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them from the world, but that you keep them from the evil, evil things or evil one. Verse 16, out of the world they are not, of the world they are not, just as I am not of this world. Verse 17, sanctify them in your truth. Now, if you're wise, you would uh, highlight or just write that sentence down because it's giving us a principle that's going to impact every aspect of our being every day. Look again. It says, sanctify them in your truth. See, most people don't understand sanctification. What is sanctification? Well, it's rooted, rooted in that word holy. The word sanctification is, is derived both in Hebrew and in Greek, from that same root, which means holy. What do we learn about holy? It's related to the purposes of God. So we become holy. That's what sanctification is, a process of becoming holy. Now, it's not speaking about salvation. Salvation, it's instantaneous. The moment we believe, we are saved. But sanctification is a process. It is where we grow and mature so that the purposes of God become displayed in our life. And where do we find those purposes of God? Well, look at this scripture. He says in verse 17, sanctify them in your truth. It's only when we acknowledge the scripture is the truth of God. And there we find the purposes of God. It's only when we take hold of them and our purposes are his purposes, are God's going to be moving in our life to bring about this. So he says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Where do we find the purposes of God? Where do we find truth? In his word. Verse 18, just as you have sent me into the world, also I am sending them into the world. So 
there's a message here of service. So we are sanctified, we are matured, we find ourselves becoming more like God. Where does he say? He says in Leviticus 19, you be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And all of this is found in the purposes of God, which are the truth of God, which is the Word of God. And He gives us that in order to send us into the world to do His work. And we've already been told, both in chapter 15, chapter 16, and now here in chapter 17, that we are going to be hated. And this hatred is going to lead to persecution. So, verse, verse 17, he says, Just as you have sent me into the world, also I send them into the world. world. Verse 19, In behalf of them I, uh, I sanctify myself, meaning I'm going to do the purposes that you've given me, in order also that they be sanctified, how? In your truth. So Messiah is saying this, you know, if I'm going to be sanctified in their eyes, if they're going to see your holiness through me, I'm going to have to do your purpose. And what's he speaking about? Going to the cross, laying down his life. And that's exactly the call that we have upon our life to lay it down, to take up our cross and to walk with him. And it's when we do this, are we going to be recipients of the power and the authority and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see things differently. We're going to see things from His perspective. And it's all on account of what? Well, we're going to see it. It's all of an outcome of true faith. Again, verse, verse 19, he says, In behalf of them I sanctify myself, in order also that they shall be sanctified in truth. Verse 20, Not concerning these do I pray alone, but also concerning the ones who will believe through their word in me. Now, that's the clearest example. When Messiah's praying and making these statements that he's been making since chapter 15, especially in this prayer in chapter 17, he says, you know, not just these disciples am I praying about. This information that he's been providing, it's not for the disciples, meaning Peter and John and so forth. No. He says, I'm praying for those who will come to faith, who will believe on account of their testimony. And really, that's the emphasis of this passage. Those who are going to be of faith down through the, the generations up until the time of the establishment of his kingdom. So he says, not concerning these do I pray alone, but also concerning the ones who will believe on account of their word, they believe in me, in order that all shall be one. Now, he keeps talking about this oneness, oneness with one another, oneness with Messiah, oneness with God, and in oneness, what happens? Well, this word one, if you're a good student of the Bible, you will be thinking of Genesis chapter 1. Because there it speaks about in the beginning of God's uh, putting things into order. Remember God said, let there be light. Let it separate the darkness from the light. And it was, and it says, not the first day, but one day. See, the reason why... In Genesis, it uses the phrase one day and not the first day is that it speaks about unity. The chapter of Genesis, chapter 1 of Genesis, speaks about God's will becoming a reality. And it talks about that for the first creation. And we need to glean that principle of oneness in order for the second creation. What's the second creation? Well, the rabbis call redemption the second creation. What they mean by that is the creation of the kingdom of God. It comes about through this oneness, this unity with God. And that's what Messiah has been speaking about over and over. So he says once more, he says, I pray for these that will come to faith on account of their word in me in order that they all shall be one. Just as you, Father, is one 
in me and also I in you in order also they in me shall be one so it's hard to miss this it's unity with the Father unity with the Son unity with the body of believers that bring us into a position of power where God's purposes can be a reality why do I say God's purposes can be a reality just keep reading verse 22 and I, verse 21 at the end, excuse me, in order that the world should believe that you sent me. Now, how many times has he said this? That the world might believe that you have sent me. That truth changes everything. When we really believe Yeshua was sent by the Father for the purpose of the kingdom, everything changes in a person's life. Now, verse 22. And I, the glory which you had given me, I give to them, in order that they shall be one, just as we are one. Also in them, also you are in me. In order that they shall be made, what does it say? Complete. Now that word complete can also be perfect. Now here's what the scripture is trying to tell us. It is true, believing that truth, that God is going to go to work in our life and that He is going to bring about a change. What change? That He is going to make us, what the Scripture says? That we are going to be made complete or made perfect. And the important thing to see here about this verse of Scripture is that it's in the passive. It's this recognition, this understanding that God has sent Yeshua into the world. When we believe that, and it impacts our life, it is going to transform our life, and we're going to be made perfect in God's sight. That is, that we're going to carry out completely His work. So let me ask you a question. Do you see that happening in your life? Do you see your life growing and maturing and being transformed into the completion of the purposes of God? Where perfection, and why do I say perfection? Because the Scripture says, that we are called to be perfect. What does that mean? Well, we're going to have to talk about that next week when we continue on and conclude John 17 about the power of perfection in the life of the believer. Until then, may God bless you.